Thank you, Ricky Lee and Caden. Try to get through this uh, sermon I mean, as quick as I can. I don't want y'all to be here all day. Uh, do have some things that God has laid upon my heart that I'm just going to even try to get through the sermon. Uh, one of the things that's said a lot of times in graduations is you've made it. Uh, it's got a whole new meaning with this year's graduating class. This year alone uh, could be a whole verse to Billy Joel's We Didn't Start the Fire. Yeah. <laughs> it's been an interesting year. Um, I saw a, a, a meme the other day. Those of you who don't know what memes are, they're pictures with words on them that are funny. Uh, that basically just show the calendar for every outbreak that will happen month by month uh, here uh, in the world. It basically said January of 2020 started off with Australia on fire. February brought the threat of World War III. March was 90 day long because of the COVID virus. We've had protests and riots in June. Uh, it said July more than likely will produce a solar flare. In August, uh, Yellowstone will erupt. September, aliens will invade. And don't worry, October and November will be the return of COVID. And then December will be right out of the page of the movie Armageddon. So that's what we have to look forward to for the rest of the year. But all fun and jokes aside, it's, it's been a really weird year. And the truth is that our future has had more ups and downs. And we're going to continue to have more ups and downs. And what I want to share with you guys today is really uh, a video uh, in honor of one of my friends. Uh, Brandon Kalicki was diagnosed with cancer a month before uh, Xander was. Um, Brandon... Uh, had an amazing testimony in the fact that he went into spontaneous remission. He was being treated at a OU Medical, and they were going to send him down to Baylor. By the time he got down to Baylor, his cancer was gone. Uh, many of you who went to TBA with us, or Ten Killer Baptist Association, First Baptist Watonga went with us, and Brandon was there with us that week. Um, last time I saw Brandon was in February at the Super Summer Retreat before the world got shut down. And uh, we were just making fun of how old everybody had gotten. Brandon had a pain in his back and was limping like Edgar off of Men in Black. Uh, I couldn't hear anything in the restaurant because everything was so loud. Uh, one of my friends had to go to the bathroom six times uh, while, we were, while we were eating, and we just laughed at how old we were getting. Uh, turned out that Brandon had a tumor in his back. His cancer had come back after 16 years of being in remission. Uh, at the beginning of all the COVID, uh, he made a video, and I'm going to share some of the points to his video. Um, he went into the hospital, beat cancer a second time. One of Brandon's favorite movies uh, was Rocky. Uh, he would even admit that Rocky V was a good movie. That's where I questioned his thinking. <laughs> um, so he beat cancer a second time. And then he got pneumonia. And the day before Mother's Day, Brandon passed away. But before Brandon went into the hospital, he made a video. And I want to share real quickly just some of the points that he made in that video because his video dealt with dealing with crisis. And I don't think that that couldn't be any more fitting for everybody. As I talk to our seniors, as I preach on days like this, I, I want to preach a message to our seniors, but I also don't want to leave out that we've got other people in the room. And, and, and as our seniors are about to move into a world that is going to completely change and they will face crisis, every single one of us face crisis every day in our life. And so there were a few things that Brandon mentioned in this video. And, and you can take notes if you want. If, if not, that's fine. It's not going to hurt my feelings. But the first thing he said is we need to be honest with ourselves. When we're facing crisis, we need to be honest with ourselves. And he, Brandon talked about a story, a passage that God brought into his mind, which is Mark 9, uh, 17 through 24. And it says this, and someone from the crowd answered him, teacher, I brought my son to you for he has a spirit that makes him mute and it seizes him and it throws him down and he foams and grinds his teeth and he becomes rigid. I asked your disciples to cast it out and they were not able. And he answered, oh, you faithless generation. How long will I be with you? How long, will, how long will I have to bear you? Bring him to me. And they brought the boy to him. 
And the spirit saw him and immediately convulsed the boy, and he fell on the ground, and he rolled, foaming at the mouth. And Jesus asked the father, how long has this been happening? And he said from childhood, it often cast him into the, uh, into the fire or into water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, have compassion upon us. And Jesus said to him, if you can, all things are possible for one who believes. Immediately the father cried out and said, I believe, help my unbelief. And I think if we want to face crisis, I think one of the things that we have to do is we have to be honest with ourselves. And this idea that sometimes we think that we have all the faith in the world to follow Jesus Christ, but there's still an aspect of us that needs help. There's still an aspect of us that has, just like this father, he immediately said, I believe, but help my unbelief. And I think that if we want to face crisis, we have to be honest with ourselves. We have to be honest that we have doubts. We have to be honest with this human side of us that we have. We have to be honest with the fact, as I tell you, I miss my son every single day. But I also know that he is in a better place. There are good days and there are sad days. And that's okay. One of the things that Brandon said in his video is he said, you need to doubt your doubts before you doubt your God. When we face crisis and we don't know what's going on, instead of doubting God, we've got so many people with this idea that, uh, that, that, that Jesus Christ is not the answer, which could be further from the truth in whatever crisis we are facing. Because Jesus Christ is most definitely the answer to any problem that you are facing. What he has called us to do, how the, the peace that he has called, that he, is, he can bring into our lives, he is the answer. I've seen t-shirts this week uh, that, that one said Jesus saved, and in the saved part, it turned saved into slaved. And it just broke my heart to see that somebody was wearing that t-shirt. I saw in a riot this week, someone held up a sign that says, if Jesus comes back, kill him again. And I'm one of those people that I'm just sitting there saying that we can look on that side and we can groan and we should. But we have doubts in our own life of what Jesus can do, of what he is going to do. And we need to doubt our doubts ever before we doubt our Savior. Because he is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. He does not change. He does not waver. The problem I think that most of us have is this idea is our understanding of what God's goal is when he means that he wants to bless us. So many people look at the material things. So many people look at, at, at their emotional standpoint or where they are. How could God bless me? My life is in shambles. The truth is this. God wants to bless us into the point that we bring glory to him. Amen. We are the ones that change. We are the ones that doubt. And no matter what we are facing in our lives, God wants us to bring glory to him. Isaiah 55, 8 says this. It says, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, and neither my ways are your ways, declares the Lord. And the truth is this. Things in our life change, but Jesus never does. And if we're honest with ourselves when we face crisis, that we have doubts, that we, that we have things that we, we're worried about, that unbelief in our lives, we can take that to the Lord and say, God, help me with this unbelief. The second thing that, that Brandon talked about in his video was that we need to stay focused on the Lord. And I think that this is an incredible passage and, and, and incredible passage, incredible thought, and it's layered and it's so deep. And I, I don't know if I will ever fully comprehend it but it is this idea that we do need to stay focused on the Lord. And, and, and I will share more in a second, but I think the aspect is this. One, we need to find Jesus Christ. Because many of us, I don't know if the Jesus we're focused on is the Jesus of Scripture. That needs to be our challenge every day. Am I focused on the Jesus of Scripture or am I focused on a Jesus that I have constructed myself? Because the one that you've constructed will always fail you. 
But when you focus on the Christ of Scripture, the Christ who is the one that came and died, and you focus on his goal and what he came to do and what he asked of your life, then you begin to see things clearly. But when we begin to make exceptions or say that this person does that or this person does that or this person over there, so I'm okay, we are missing the point. The story on this idea of uh, our prayer needs to be that Jesus captures our gaze. Think back to the story of Jesus walking on water. A lot of us know this story. It's a story that we're told in Sunday school. It's a story that Vacation Bible School, it's one of my favorite passages because I, I was always that kid that was like, Jesus, one time. I stand at the edge of the pool and I go, one time, Jesus. One time. And every time I sank like a rock. But you've got this, the disciples. Let's, let's really focus on this story first. Four of them are professional fishermen. Twelve of them are petrified because of a storm that came up. Four of them have spent their entire lives in boats, and they're all scared. And then they see a ghost because it's something that they can't explain. Jesus says, it's me, and Peter says, well, if it's you, tell me to come out there. And I love Jesus' response. He's like, oh, bring it, big boy. Come on. Peter does coolest thing, I think. He begins to walk on the water out to Jesus. And then Peter does what we all do. It says in scripture, it says, but when he saw the wind, he was afraid and he began to sink because he took his eyes off Jesus. My fear is this, too. Like I said, we've constructed this aspect of our own Jesus. My fear goes deeper than that. My fear is that some of us in this room have accepted our Jesus that we have constructed. My fear is that some of us have, have taken a gospel that may have been proclaimed properly or taken a gospel that may have been uh, uh, twisted and, and shifted a little bit different way, and we have accepted a false gospel we don't accept Jesus Christ so that we can go to heaven when we die. I realized when I, was, when I was 10 years old that that was the first gospel that I accepted. My parents, I, I, my, some of my testimony has to do with, both my parents were born uh, uh, fairly late in life to their, uh, to their parents. Um, my grandparents' ages at the birth of my parents uh, were 51, 43, 41, and 39 turned 40 the next day. Uh, so needless to say, and my dad's the baby of the family, obviously. Uh, my dad is, is my dad's older brother, uh, uh, was 18 years older than him. By the time my dad was one, he was an uncle. So I've got cousins that are, that are closer to my dad's age than they are my age. I have cousins who have children that are older than me. Um, and my dad always talked about, and Ricky Lee, this isn't us because we were 37 when Baker was born. Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry, I was 37, you were 36. You turned 37 three days later. Um, my parents, my dad always said that he thought his parents were old. Uh, that's just how it was. So by the time I was uh, four years old, three of my grandparents had passed away. My mom's mom died a month before I was born, and my, both my grandparents died uh, within a year. My grandfathers died within a year of each other. And at the age of four to six, I didn't know how to process that. But I heard this idea that they're in heaven. Well, that's where I wanted to be. But that was, that's not the gospel. That's, that's something that, that, that is a benefit of receiving Christ, but it's not the reason that we receive Christ. Some of us receive Christ because we think all of our problems will go away. I think false Creek is really bad about this at times. Because it's such an incredible environment and people feel so empowered by the Holy Spirit and, and they think this is what life is like. And the truth is, is False Creek is the mountaintop. It's not the valley. You're not meant to live on the mountaintop. It's cold and there's less oxygen up there. You're not meant to live there. And people receive a Christ because I love the way that I feel right now. And you go home and literally most of the time nothing changes. Like, God, I thought you were going to bless me. I thought things were going to change. And, and a false gospel has been accepted again. Jesus told his disciples, if they persecuted me, they will persecute you. 
He told his disciples, people will know that you are my disciples by your love. We accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior because we realize that we are sinners on our own accord, separated from Jesus Christ. We begin to lose our gaze on Jesus Christ when we think that Jesus didn't take that big of a beating for us. That the nails on his hands and feet didn't hurt that much because I'm not that bad of a person. Which is a false statement. Our sin, your sin, my sin. Let's not, let's not look at us because we can look at other people in the room. I'm not going to name names because I like all of you guys. We can look at people in the room and go, man, I know their sin's worse than mine. We do that a lot. I want you to look at yourself. Your sin caused Jesus to be flogged, to be whipped, to be beaten. As the scripture says, he was unrecognizable as a man. Then he was nailed to the cross. And through all of this, the most agonizing pain for him was being separated from his father. He did this because of your sin. And when we lose that, we take our gaze off of Jesus Christ. And that is what the gospel is. He died so that our sin could be forgiven. And he died so that he can be our Lord. We, Bud may have said this last week. I think he did. He talked about we love to separate Jesus being our Lord and our Savior. There is no separation. Amen. He is your Lord and your Savior. It is one in the same. And if he is not the dominating factor of every decision that you make on how you live your life, on how you treat other people, then you need to re-examine your salvation. Amen. We lose our focus on Jesus. The last thing that Brandon talked about was this simple aspect of hiding God's word in your heart. Psalm 119.11, I, I, I love this passage, and, and, and for some of us, we understand this. as I have stored up your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Man, if you guys are anything like us, we're not, I don't want to say that we're hoarders by any means. But, you know, Ricky Lee said, do we have an empty tub in the shed? And I'm like, hey, our, tub, our shed's about to throw up tubs. There's all kinds of stuff out there. We gotta shift our, you know, we're, it's it's the summer season, so our our spring and winter clothes need to come out of our closet, and the, we need to make this this shift. And we've got got uh, stuffed animals that our kids touch two times at Disney World uh, that we have in tubs, and and I've got baseball cards. It's not just them; I have baseball cards that I collected when I was eight years old, and trust me, they're worth nothing. I looked um, in our shed, and we're, we're we're storing this. We store junk, man. The attic's full of Christmas stuff. I'm at the point now that I'm like, I, I, I laid some flooring in our attic so that we'd have some, some place to store stuff. And I mean, I got a, I got a table up there that the church was going to throw away, but we just had to have. It's been in my attic for eight years. I got chairs up there that we just had to have. It's not all Ricky Lee. It's me too. We store all kinds of junk. Scripture needs to be the one thing. That's, where, that's how we know Jesus Christ. How we know Jesus Christ is through Scripture. And that's what we need to store in our life because that everything in Scripture points to Jesus Christ. And we need to know Scripture and not just... We need to know it. I remember an, an aha moment of mine that I was just like, oh my gosh. I've been a minister for 15 years and I've never put this together. We, we did a, a reading through scripture a few years ago. And, and I was reading and it was, it was in the, the aspect when the Israelites were in the desert and God provided manna for them every day. You could only get one day's worth unless it was the Sabbath. Then you could get two days worth. But if you got more than one day's worth, I love that it said it would, it would stank, not stink. It was stank in my translation, which I, I really, I really that, that got me. I understood that. But it was a, the read through the Bible was Old Testament, New Testament at the same time. And almost in correlation with that, I'm reading the Lord's Prayer where he's speaking to these Hebrews. He's speaking to these Israelites. And he says, give us this day our daily bread. And I'm like, holy cow. 
He's referencing the manna in the desert. They can only get a day's proportion of it. Jesus says in our prayers, our prayers need to be not one week, one month. It needs to be this idea of God, give me what I need to get through today. God works in mysterious ways. Our Sunday school lesson today was on uh, Joshua and the Battle of Jericho. I remember talking about this with Bud once. I mean, like, literally, okay, we got Chaz going on. I'm not going to get real political. But if we decided that we were going to attack Chaz as the United States, say, man, this is a foreign country, they declared war on us. If we were going to do that, I highly doubt that our military, that's a new word I just created, (laughs) military generals would go before our president and say, I've got this idea. Musicians. <laughs> Musicians. That's how we're going to attack them. God works in mysterious ways. I, I, I can imagine Joshua getting those instructions and going, dude, God, you're crazy. This is the stupidest battle attack plan I've ever heard in my life. We need to know the word front and back. We need to understand how it flows because there are people out there who can take one passage out of scripture and make it mean something that was never intended to mean. When I have kids ask me questions like, I don't get this. You've taught that this is not it, but in the scripture it says this. And I sit there and say, well, when you look at scripture as a whole, scripture teaches against that. So maybe when he's talking about this, we need to dive in to who he's writing the letter to, when he wrote the letter, why he's having to address that problem. And when you understand the the original intent of the author, it may mean something different because the truth is this. We as Americans, we cannot Americanize the Bible. We live in a different culture. We look at things differently from the way that the Bible was written. And if we take the Bible and we put our culture into it to understand what is being said, we will miss the mark. And the way that we do that is we know Scripture. We read Scripture. We study Scripture. We memorize Scripture. We let it be the number one thing that drives our hearts and our lives. Because crisis is rarely scheduled. Rarely scheduled. Ricky Lee and I joke, there, there are people who, man, man we're going we're gonna to wait to have kids till we have enough money. And I'm like, well, you will never have kids then. <laughs> it's, there's things in lives that aren't scheduled. Crisis is not scheduled, and if we want to get through crisis and we want to uphold the love and the peace and and the forgiveness and the grace of Jesus Christ, it needs to be buried in our heart. Not patriotism. I love the United States of America, but the Bible is more important than the United States of America. How God has called me to live and how God has called me to act is far more important, and that's what needs to be done. Because if we think Crisis is over. You're crazy. Or dare I say from the pulpit, you're smoking crack. (laughs) Crisis will continue to interrupt your life and scheduled at times that you, probably the worst time that you need it. But the word steadies us. Just as the disciples Let's go back to the scripture. Just as the disciples were in a boat that a storm had overtaken, the word of God stepped into the boat and steadied it. I hope that you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. I hope that you are following him. And I hope that it is not a savior that you have constructed. I hope that it's not a savior that you have, have, I like this about Jesus, but don't, and we say, sometimes it's subconscious and we don't even know that we're doing it. There's difficult aspects in scripture that we need to learn to deal with. I think one of the saddest passages in scriptures is found in John. After Jesus feeds the 5,000, the crowds are hanging around him. And he says, hey, if you don't eat of my flesh or drink of my blood, you have nothing to do with me. And it said many stopped following him that day. 
Jesus specifically told him, he said, you're following me because I fed your bellies. These were people who were at the feeding of the 5,000. And I, I fear that that passage, Jesus says later, many will say, did I not cast out demons in your name? Did I not prophesy in your name? And I will tell you, depart from me, I never knew you. Don't follow Jesus because he feeds your belly. Follow Jesus because he took away your sins. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we come to you. And God, I just thank you for this day that we could glorify you, that we could seek you, that we could serve you, that we could worship you, that we could celebrate you. And Father, I pray that that would be our focus as we leave. God, help us to just put our trust and faith in everything in you, Father. In your name I pray. Amen. Before we end in our unconventional, un un that's what I'm looking for, way that we have been ending, I, I want you to just have a little time and think, Man, I, I ask the youth all the time, God, what do I need to do different so that I'm not the same person that walked into this building? What do I need to do different so that I can follow you better? <coughs> I want to ask you guys, just give some thought to that. We will have uh, people outside if you have an offering that you want to give. We're still not passing the plate, different stuff to that effect. Thank you guys for being here today. If you need to speak to anyone, I'll be available. Bud will be available. We have people here who can help you with any need that you may have. So why don't you go ahead and stand. Uh, stand up. Don't, don't join hands. You can't do that. That's a big no-no. But just stand up, and uh, the band will sing, and we will be dismissed.